here is the subject of our walk today. The River Pin, the glorious little River Pin. So we go back along this lane here to, the, uh, to Bridge Road. It was a bit of a giveaway that, isn't it? Bridge Road. And so it must have been here where the pin crosses near the bottom of the ancient Pinner High Street. During the Second World War, the, uh, the river was dammed and the water was used for putting out fires during air raids. And here's the pin here flowing into the Memorial Park. So that's right, today we're going to walk along the River Pin. This is a walk I've had on my list for so long. I think I set out to do it about uh, five years ago and there was really heavy rain and I had to abandon it. And I think I did the River Stort the next day instead. Shows you how long ago that was. And it was a wet morning today, but I thought nothing is going to stop me walking the pin this time, even though apparently a lady just told me there's rain forecast for this afternoon. But I'm really looking forward to this walk, following the beautiful little river Pin. So we're way over in West London out beyond Harrow in Pinner. And the glorious little river Pin is one of the three principal rivers of the old county of Middlesex. The county which no longer technically exists, but you still do see it written on addresses to this very day. It's a bit of an oddity and an obsession of my good mate, Nick Papadimitrio. The Pin rises on Harrow Weald Common, a little bit further to the north of here, but it's not really accessible at that stage, I don't think, but there is a walk produced by, I think it's produced by Hillingdon Council, or it might even be produced by um, Harrow Council, I think it's probably Hillingdon, called the Selendine Trail. And that's kind of what I'm using as the basis of the walk today. That's why I'm wandering away from the footpath as well, because the Selendine Trail is apparently over here somewhere. And that's a 12 mile long trail that starts here at Pinner. I'm just going through Pinner Memorial Park and it ends uh, by the Grand Union Canal near West Drayton. The pin itself actually makes its confluence with the Fraze River just slightly after that, and then it runs into the Colne. So the pin is technically a tributary of the River Colne. And then, like I say, I've been looking forward to this walk for a number of years. So no matter how much of it we do, it's gonna be great. We won't do all of it, I'll warn you now, because it's about 1.30, it's a 12 mile route, what with the old filming and stuff. I don't think we'll get that done in daylight, but we'll just have a nice day out, right? <laughs> Walking along the river Pin. The house there on the other side of this little lake is what remains of the home of uh, Lord Nelson's grandson. There you go. So this here is a little 19th century dog cemetery. Which is a lovely little touch, isn't it? Look, you can just make out the word faithful on the top of this one here. Architecturally, Pinner's a really fascinating area. I know you might think that these houses here aren't particularly interesting, but it's part of the old Metrolands. So you've got classic kind of 30s, 20s and 30s suburbia, but then you've also got all those ancient buildings in the high street as well. Now go through this lovely allotment site here, Cuckoo Hill Allotments. And here is the pin as it emerges from beneath the streets. It's had a short culvert. I think it's above ground a lot of the way now. Very uh, kind and generous lady who was out jogging stopped running to uh, 
confirm that I, this was the right way because initially I thought it seems to be going in the wrong direction but she stopped and she pointed me in the right way before carrying on her run. Thank you very much. You'd forgive a jogger for not breaking their stride to help somebody who should be able to find a route like this. In here you really feel now that we are definitely in autumn. You think about the last walk that I filmed along the Thames Estuary out to Shoebury Ness and the Wakering Stairs and there people were sunbathing on the beach just just over a week later and look it's really is autumn now. Great season for walking though. Hearing those birds in the trees, I'm pretty sure they're rooks, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, really reminds me of being out near here actually over 10 years ago now, 11 years ago with my good pal Nick Papadimitrio recording an episode of our radio show Ventures and Adventures in Topography with the wonderful author Tim Bradford, author of The Groundwater Diaries, one of the uh, original modern Lost Rivers books. Recommend finding a copy of that if you can. I mean, that was a great day and that was in the winter. And I think I kind of slipped into the river. We were walking along and I can't remember the name of the river. The area we were walking in was called Roxeth in South Harrow, which I think Nick said was named after the rocks, uh, the rooks, the place of the rooks. I'll put the name of the river up here if I can find it, that is. Oh, lovely bend in the river here. We are now in the London borough of Hillingdon on the edge of East Coat, which is a fascinating place. This copse of trees here is named after a lady, Margaret Hinman, who was a great benefactor to the area of East Coat. Apparently you can see tree creepers in here at some point. That's a type of bird, apparently. I'm reading this off of some information about the Selendine Walk, by the way. Well, I'm not reading it, I'm sort of misremembering it slightly. This is called Long Meadow, and you can see why. gentleman came over to me and said if you're lucky you may see a kingfisher along here. He'd seen one three times. He also said you can see little egrets and occasionally a heron. I have to say the people of Pinner and East Coast have been very friendly, very helpful. It's been a very convivial start to the walk. I wasn't sure whether it was a bad idea to wear my Sacred River Lee t-shirt today. I was a bit concerned it might upset the, uh, the deity of the River Pin, but so far so good. So over this wooden bridge here takes us into the past, into a, a distant land. This is all that remains of East Coat House a house that was first mentioned in 1507 and then it was knocked down by the council in the 1960s. My guess would be that it must have been in quite a state of disrepair. But the, the public requested that the, uh, the walled gardens and the outbuildings be retained and here they are. The gardens set to date from the 17th century. And this is the, the dovecot which was really a, a pigeon house, a place to keep pigeons for, for food, for consumption. Apparently pigeon pie was a real favourite in those days, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Wow, this walled garden is a real delight, isn't it? It would have been built to grow um, herbs and flowers and perhaps fruit against the walls to capture the heat. It's a real little oasis, isn't it? And now it's freely open to the public. Even now at the beginning of October, it's still full of flowers. It's a real haven of beauty and uh, of wildlife. The bees buzzing around. You can hear the birds. Returning to the river here, just below East Coat House Gardens, 
I'm going to push on now towards King's College playing fields. Just where the sun is falling on the river there. That was where a large white bird took off and flew along the river. I don't know if it was the heron, it was either the egret or, or the heron that that gentleman mentioned earlier. How wonderful. Maybe we'll get another sighting later on. We've been lucky with our, with our road action. It hasn't been a great deal. We've got a little bit here with the pin running along the right-hand side there. Not for much longer, though. Love this uh, mock Tudor electricity substation. Fantastic. So here we have East Coat Village Conservation Area. And straight away I can see a kind of timber framed building up there which I'm going to take to be Tudor. I need to source my lunch along here somewhere. Deep Sea Fish and Chips is shut. Village news. It's going to be not the greatest sandwiches or lunch selection is it? Bella Pizza, Bella Roma Pizzeria. A bit heavy for a walk and then we've got Chicken Plus, which I don't really want to be eating fried chicken, do I? Oh dear. There is the Black Horse Pub, of course, but I uh, haven't really got time to stop for a pub lunch. I want to keep pushing on, man. Eat on the hoof. Oh, actually, look, there's a pie and mash shop here. Lawrence's Pie, Mash and Liquor. And they also do stewed and jelly deals. It doesn't look open, but let's have a look. Unfortunately, Lawrence's Pie and Mash is only open Wednesday to Saturday. It's Monday today. So in a situation like that, you can always rely on a Ginster's peppered steak slice. And I've got a bag of nuts as well for later on. Good value as well, 139 for those nuts. So that's my food for, for today. Now what I like about this superficially quite functional information board here, London Borough Hillingdon, welcome to Pin Meadows, but I like the way that it points out the topography of the, of the park, placing the meadows within the flood pane of the River Pin and the coal catchment area, which of course is another way of looking at this landscape as opposed to kind of uh, parishes and districts and all that kind of business. Walking across a beautiful meadow like this brings home how rural this area would have been until, you know, into the 20th century at least. I mean, there still are farms around the edge of the London borough of Hillingdon. I don't know if this is actually supported by fact, but to me, Hillingdon has always come across as being one of the greenest boroughs, particularly around uh, the western fringe of Hillingdon, where it abuts the uh, the Colne Valley and beyond that you've got Buckinghamshire and you've got you've got you know picture postcard countryside so spaces like this really knit all of that together. Interesting, there's a, there's a cycle track in the park here. It's not often you see that kind of thing. I was kind of a little bit, I was gonna say obsessed, certainly fascinated by East Coast around the time I started researching my book, This Other London, available from all good bookstores, but particularly the Newham Bookshop. And I'd never actually, I'd never actually been to Eastcote, and I remember there was, there was somebody at the publishers who'd grown up here, and she just couldn't fathom my fascination with this area. And it, but it stemmed from uh, reading a, a book called England's Character, published, I think, in 1936 by S.P.B. Mays, very intriguing character from that period, a very sort of early um, topographical broadcaster, so to speak, authored a number of books, did radio shows on the BBC, one of which was called Microphone at Large, Travelling the Country. How wonderful is that? And he wrote about these um, suburbs of northwest London, I suppose Metroland, 
as, as we know it now. Was it known by that then? I think it probably was, wasn't it? He was really interested in this area of northwest London, these suburbs. He used to call it going suburb hunting. And he wrote very glowingly of Harrow and of Pinner as well. I can't remember whether he mentions East Coat or not, but there's a modernist block of flats called Pinner Court, which I did end up visiting on my uh, Metroland walk. Put a link to that below. And the same architect who designed that really quite striking modernist block of flats, housing development, quite advanced for its time in Britain, because we were quite slow adopters, I think, of some of those ideas of architecture. The same architect also worked on the planning and the architecture of um, East Coat Town Centre as well. So I thought, I think I saw East Coat as being like this secret modernist suburb slumbering out here where no one's really paying any attention. <laughs> I feel like I have to take a little detour away from the pin here, not very far. Up beside uh, Winston Churchill Hall, there is an ancient farm here, a medieval farm with a barn that's said to date from 1300. Got to go and try and take a look, right? Wow. And here it is, just sat here amongst the houses. Time has moved on all around it and it stayed still where it was in the 14th century. The Manor farmhouse dates from 1508 and it was built for the, um, the visiting dignitaries from King's College, Cambridge, who owned this land. And they were somewhere a bit more comfortable than the priory that was here, so this was built for them. And it was used for manorial courts right until 1925. That's amazing, isn't it? And this mound here is part of a, a mott and bailey. I guess the mound being the mott, the raised area, the mount. I'm not sure about the date, but they have found remains of a, of a 12th century uh, abbey or priory here. So this would have been the bailey here with the courtyard and the outbuildings sitting beneath. The, the mott with its uh, what would likely have been a stone keep set atop it. And this is the moat from the Mott and Bailey site. So this here is the little barn. Now it's a, a library called Manor Farm Library and it was built sometime before 1600. Isn't that incredible? And it was in use as a barn until the 1920s when it was converted into this library here. And this beast here is the Great Barn, built around 1300 in the reign of Edward I. Get your head around that. And of course it is the oldest timber framed building or timber framed barn, I should say, in Greater London. And it, what an incredible thing. It was built from wood, cut in rice lip woods. It was used to store crops and animals. What a majestic site. This should justifiably be one of the most famous buildings in London. It should be on every tourist's trail. Rice lip is an ancient manor. It's recorded in the Doomsday Book and would have been a significant presence in Saxon times as well. After the Norman Conquest, it passed into the hands of the Abbey of Beck, which was a really significant place in, uh, in the Norman power structure. Beck is a place in Normandy and is actually uh, in chime with our walk today. It uh, takes its name from a river, the River Beck. And the Abbey of Beck was near the confluence of two rivers, the Beck and, I'll put the other one on the screen. It was held by the uh, Abbey of Beck until the 15th century. And it was the abbots of Beck who built a priory here at some point in the 11th or 12th century. Now those clouds do look very ominous indeed, so. I'm not sure if our walk's going to get cut short by the weather today. Whatever, we'll push on for as long as we can anyway. We might get lucky, it might not rain for very long. Back to the River Pin. 
just as the rain starts to come down. You see it falling in the river down there. Just transferring onto my action camera now, so you'll notice a change in the audio. It's raining, it's raining quite persistently. This little bridge over the pin. And now we have a, a rare bit of road walking. The rain's really lashing down now. <laughs> oh well, something about river walks and rain, I don't know what it is. So we're getting close to the, the part of Ryslip where I've walked before and I've walked a little bit of the, the pin on a number of walks, I think two or three walks, I've crossed short sections of it. Uh, over here near Breakspear Road, that's really like the countryside around here. And then a little bit further along there's, um, there is a, a moat, a site of a moat somewhere. But I also know as well, when you get towards Icken and Marsh, that's seriously wet there all the time <laughs> so on a day like today and we had a lot of rain over the weekend as well it's gonna be like a bog let's see how much longer we can keep going on for uh, this is pretty muddy through here now it's gonna slip over again over in west london taking a little bit of shelter under this uh, low hanging oak canopy here. It's really lovely. Most of the other trees I've stopped <laughs> beneath haven't offered much, much shelter at all. Um, somewhere near here, around West Wyslip, when they were doing the um, HS2 works, and I can hear some heavy machinery behind this hedge line here on the other side of the river, so I've got a feeling it may be very close to where I am now. They were doing some archeology span and they discovered um, a hoard, what became known as the uh, Hillingdon Hoard, earlier this year, only I think it was around April 2020. And amongst the hoard was a hoard of, of Iron Age coins from the first century BC. And as they couldn't find any kind of um, settlement around here, they posited that they must have been buried in the ground for other reasons. Could have been as a boundary marker. The other intriguing possibility was seeing as the hoard of coins was very close to the river pin that they were a votive offering to the river pin a votive offering to the deity of the river pin how wonderful is that for our walk today yeah here it is just on the edge of the golf course is the hs2 works the high speed rail works very controversial carving their way through the landscape and you can see the proximity of the HS2 works to the river pin so I wonder if it was around here somewhere that they discovered the Havering hoard that would make sense wouldn't it my suspicions may well be correct I could be way off but it did say West Ryslip near to the river pin I think I'm okay. How would you know what U46 and uh, U43 were? But I think I'm okay. My footpath heads left here beneath the railway bridge. Yeah, I've walked through here a couple of years ago. I think I was just trying to walk west out of London and I got really confused. No, that's when I walked a little bit of the Selendine route. And here we have Pinchester Moat. A wonderful little um, interpretation board here telling us how the moat was part of the, uh, the manor of the Swakeleys. Swakeleys is a big house we'll see later on and it would date from occupation of the site is 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. And the moat itself 
was dug in the 13th and 14th centuries in the 12 and 1300s. That's kind of incredible, isn't it? And there would have been a little wooden bridge over the moat. Let's kind of have a look, see if we can have a look. It'll be quite dark. So this is the River Pin, and it was built on this bend in the pin here. It's just on the other side of the river. So here's the moat, Pinchester Moat. There's something undeniably magical about a medieval moat. There's a few of them around London. And they've really got something about them. How many, uh, how many medieval sites is that today? I think it's at least three significant medieval sites, but not just like the sites. Structures, buildings, <laughs> actual stuff you can, you can touch, you can look at just lying around here in the West London suburbs along the delightful River Pin, one of the principal rivers of Middlesex and a river full of stories. I was reading in a history of Ryslip how there's a lot of mature old trees here just lying around in the housing estates and that these would have been remnants of the field boundaries the medieval field boundaries that were marked out across this landscape and that the roads still conform to them. The trees being the indicators of where the boundaries once were. Through this gate here and carrying on, at least the rain has stopped for now. Kind of get little bits float down. It's um, 20 past five or just after 20 past five. So sunset, so I think it's about 20 past six. We've got about an hour till sunset and then it gets dark pretty much straight away after sunset now. Evenings have really drawn in very quickly. Uh, and of course, in a couple of weeks, the clocks go back and suddenly, um, you know, it's dark really early. Go back, go forward, I can never remember. Da, 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 go, for, go forward, go back. Anyway, it gets, <laughs> it gets dark. Uh, it will be dark at half four pretty soon. So we'll just get to where we get to. Um, I took quite a kind of relaxed attitude to this walk today. Uh, I didn't want to be kind of hung up on completing it, partly because I've walked sections of it in the past, particularly the lower part as well, on the other side of Uxbridge. Just wanted to explore this landscape, so I'm glad that we took those diversions to those incredible sites. And there is another one up here we might be able to have a look at. Uh, Swakely's house. And Swakely's house is uh, Jacobean, apparently. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful open space here. Doesn't really make much mention of it in the uh, in the notes that accompany the Selendine Way guide. This is gorgeous. I think it has a relationship with Swakely's house, the Jacobean Manor House, which is just over to the left. Interesting that the Selendine Way doesn't go along this path here beside the river. It instead goes along Swakely's Drive or Swakely's Road and then along another road, Warren Road. A bit like the Warren Road in Monster. I realised when I got to the end of Swakely's Park that to get to the house, I have to go all the way back up to the far end of the park and all the way back down the other side of the lake. It's that time of the day where I'm not doing that kind of thing. <laughs> I can see actually, I can see the end of the walk now. I think I'll end on the, on the A40. Um, the kind of tarmac umbilical cord that links me to the place of my birth. Quite a poignant road that for me, unless it's just around the corner, then we'll carry on for a bit longer. But final stretch, I can feel the final stretch. I think we go down here past the school. This is the way ahead. 
I really love paths like this. I've got a really romantic attachment to the A40. It runs right next to the village where I grew up, along with the M40 and a great big concrete viaduct that we used to climb inside as kids. And I suppose I used to get serenaded by the acoustics of the A40. This kind of white noise drone, always in the background, that I associate with home. I actually find it an incredibly comforting sound. Just going to walk across the corner of this little bit of woodland here, and then I'll uh, I'll reassess the situation. Well, we've strayed quite a bit west of the pin in crossing over the A40 there, which is on the Celandine Trail. I suppose what you would do is you go back the other way through this wood and pick it up, and then it goes through loads more open spaces. I think this is where our walk along the pin will end today. It's a good point to end there at the A40 Western Avenue. Uh, a road with a lot of lovely associations for me. I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk down the main road down to Uxbridge Town Centre and jump on the tube from there. It's quite a hefty old <laughs> journey from Uxbridge back to Leinstone. It takes about an hour and a half. But I'm just coming out now onto some sports grounds just before sunset on the edge of London. It's one of my favourite places to be at this time of day. It's a really something beautiful about it, something really heartwarming, I think is the word I was trying to look for, heartwarming. So thank you so much for joining me on this glorious walk along the River Pin. What an amazing river of stories. What a great, amazing river of of the history and of memory. I mean, my favourite thing, I think, is the, is the Hillingdon Horde. Should be no massive surprise there. Also, going to see the Great Barn built in 1300. That was astonishing. And the house there, the Manor Farm, that library. That's got to be the most incredible library building in London, or certainly a strong candidate anyway. Oh, what a great day. Wonderful day. I think we're going to have a good autumn and winter of walking ahead. I think it's going to be a really good autumn winter. I feel very optimistic and positive about it all. I hope you're doing well. Take care, stay safe. As I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. Mm -hmm.